Yes, thanks everybody. It's and thanks, Soft Ed, for having us. Absolutely. Uh, you know what's interesting about uh, this particular book is that uh, and my as my video kind of goes kind of crazy, so I'll, I'll give it a second to come back. But um, transact, transform, transcend. Uh, it, it's a book that kind of came together when John and I were talking about something just about a year ago, and it really does have uh, a place, I think, with. Uh, project managers. And that's a, a group that's very near and dear to, to us. Uh, he, John and I have been on tour. So a lot of these cities that are popping up, we, we've been and visited over the past few months. So uh, uh, if we haven't seen you yet, uh, please uh, let your local books, bookstore know that uh, we are uh, available to come and visit uh, a city near you. So I'll hush with that. And John, I'll toss it over to you to talk about how we're going to frame our uh, discussion about becoming a thoughtful leader for this group. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, let me uh, go and get through the slides here. So here's a couple in our, in our slides. We're just going to go through those. Um, so what, you know, looking at the landscape today, so I'm PMP certified through PMI, um, have, have had that for a, a longer than I care to admit. But, you know, looking at the headlines, you know, what's our world's changed a lot in the last decade. And, you know, do, so here's, you know, poking through some of the, some of the news, you know, here, here's what's coming up about, you know, uh, agile and agility and let's see this is standardizing the methodologies adapting to the fluctuating client needs you know you have um from the pmi you know institution itself or management itself there you know future challenges better writer successful consultant um earthquake recovery you know uh, so there's you know there's and you know they have their headlines this is an interesting insights article that i saw from what they're calling they're calling themselves the pmo squad where executive support 93 percent uh that the are saying uh, the pms are saying that the executives or the pmos are saying executives and you know, lack the understanding uh people's you know is P, you know 77 percent of people or the pmos use temporary project management resources so you know th this sort of paints a picture of sort of how things are and you know then you have this quora group and they have you know communication alignment managing expectations dynamics team dynamics adapting to change so what is all this you know rolling into and this is where from ours you know looking at the writing of the book and correlating you know how we can help project managers be more successful in their organizations be successful this is where you know the language comes in that we've adopted, and what we've come up with for the book. Yeah, so and I, I think that's a really great point to kind of land on. And and John, if you want to go back, uh, pop up to our bios for a second, just so they can kind of see that a little bit, I'll read through my version of this. So where we are today, you know, you've heard uh, words that are kind of popping through what John was just mentioned about. You know, uh, it's always important to have executive uh, awareness and support. And always important to uh, you know be aware of what's going on around you. Uh, I kind of come at this at a different kind of thing. So for my bio there, I won't leave it up there much longer. But you can kind of see that I've had a really interesting career both in uh, higher ed, but also in uh, what we call corporate America or even high tech. You know, working for Cisco, working for Bank of America, Duke Energy. Uh, I've also worked with a lot of school systems and a lot of um, uh, you know not for profits as well. So I come at this from you know, large scale project management, as well as small kind of ad hoc project management. So it's really interesting how, uh, you know, some of the same issues kind of pop up as John was just kind of talking about. So John, do you want to say anything more about your background or you want to go hop back to the slide? Yeah, I'll do it real nine. quick. I think, yeah, I can add some context. So if you look at the names, you know, so, so what's interesting that I find interesting from a project management, program management, product leader perspective is I'm about 50-50 government and commercial. And it's also, again, global leading brand names that we all know that have worked behind the scenes in helping them put the PMOs in place for several of these organizations you're seeing. And I've done transformations and modernizations for these organizations. And that includes also, you know, the, the startup community. So there's some startups right now, especially in the cyberspace, that they're adopting our thoughtful leadership and our, our approach, and it's becoming their operating model. And what we're gonna to talk to later on towards the end of the deck, uh, when we get, get towards there, but, but that's, so we, we have our hands and what we're seeing is the application of this thoughtfulness, being that thoughtful leader, it's applying and resonating and helping a lot of folks in a lot of diverse different areas. 
Yeah, and the way we kind of do it is, you know, what you're seeing here is an example of how we do it. And this, this is what we call a mind map or a word map, that sort of thing. So as John was talking, uh, when we were building the slide deck, I was kind of writing these little words down. Uh, what I typically do in real life is I'll, I'll, I'll hear a word and I'll, I'll write it down. If it's really interesting, I'll circle it once or twice. Uh, and then sometimes I'll, uh, you know, do four or five times that sort of thing to make sure I, I get the intent right. Um, but you see the words here, you've got this idea of executive awareness support. Uh, this idea of discerning, this idea of espoused versus the real. What is it we say we do versus what we really do? Um, and these are all kind of words that were circling when we were writing the book too. And you see the, the three words there, transactional, um, transformational, and transcendent, which of course is uh, the actual the way the book title kind of ended up, this idea of, you know, that's the three types of leaders that we kind of landed on as far as the, the, the book is concerned. Uh, the one that I kind of circled five times, by the way, uh, was being human. And I think that's what we have to remember as project managers as well is, you know, we have to talk about the human side of things. We have to talk about the empathy side of things, uh, just this idea of listening and paying attention. Uh, we do have lots of mnemonics and uh, acronyms to share with you. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of common sense, but we kind of put it in a way that's kind of fun. So, John, let's go ahead and hop to the next slide, and then we'll show some of the fun stuff that we've been doing. Uh, so what you're seeing here are the mnemonics, uh, officially, you know, the learning techniques and tools, but we call them acronyms, of course. Uh, and we did a little fun thing with Scrabble. And you can kind of see all, those are the ones from the book. And these are available in, in the book. And uh, we've got some uh, slides here that will go over lead, dent, candid, and innovate here while we're in this call with you folks today. So I think what we'll do here with this one is just kind of start off from the, the big one, which is which is being a thoughtful leader. So John, what do you think? Thoughtful leader? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And this is where being that thoughtful leader, what's really interesting is, is it's, to me, it was, it was the empathize part, right? I don't, um, we're going to go over lead, the, the dynamic there, or the, the first acronym. But when we talked about lead, that, and what we're talking to about managers and leaders throughout the organization is that these mnemonics, they look at and say, even under the stressful situation, when I'm under duress or I'm under stress, the mnemonics help me because I can just keep that, you know, lead by making a dent while being candid or, you know, they, they can make their mnemonics up and that allows them to calm themselves and be, you know, they, they said, hey, it gives me some peace of mind and allows me to stay on focus or on topic. And, and to me, that, that leads into that being human part and realizing that, hey, everybody, we're all trying, we're, you know, we, we, we're, there's stress for everybody, but let's try and have some fun while we're doing this too. Absolutely. So what you're seeing here are just a couple of intro kind of ideas or thoughts. Uh, people always ask me about, uh, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, su be successful when everybody is always hiring people from the outside? You know, they're bringing in McKinsey or they're bringing in Deloitte or bringing in any, some, some other consultant, right? When I often say, you know, why not start with be the, the leader from inside or innovate from within? This idea of be the N in innovation, if you will, if that helps. This idea of uh, making a difference from what you have already. So in order to be able to do that, you have to uh, be a, a more of a thoughtful leader. Even if your your position is, is you know, kind of down the chain a bit and maybe you've, you've kind of found a really great niche for yourself in an organization, uh, whether it's a large organization or a small organization, you've got, a, you've got a, a place you are, but there's always things you can actually do to kind of uh, contribute to the whole organization. And I think that's the big thing we've seen, particularly post pandemic, is that uh, everybody's wearing more hats than they've ever worn before. And they're doing more things than ever before. And they have to rely on each other more than ever before. So this idea of innovating from within is even more valuable than, than it ever has been. So let's go ahead and start with the, the, just the definition of a thoughtful leader, John, and we'll go from there. Okay. All right. So what is a thoughtful leader? So um, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but I'm going to kind of highlight some of the words that you kind of see there. But uh, this is this is kind of the, the, the crux of the entire book, this idea that a thoughtful leader listens. OK, I guess we can close the, this, the webinar right now, John. Let's, let's go, because that's that really is all there is to it. Listening is important, but not just with your ears, but with what your heart, your experiences and what we call the informed gut. Now, the informed gut, some folks will call that intuition. John, you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, so so there's a lot of stuff out there and a lot of different periodicals. And when we were doing the research for the book and as we dive in there, you know, more into what I'll say intuition, energy, 
and different names from different inju- various industry leaders pop up there doing the research on this. It was really surprising that the informed gut, uh, when we talk to our, you know, and, and work with our clients, that they're, they may not publicly say it, but in private, they're like, you know, I really, I really use that more than I care to admit, or I really rely on that. And that was really interesting is that, you know, there's still, we're still at the time where, you know, it's not, you know, they're not public about it, but but we're actually seeing a, a trend in more people going and, you know, understanding, you know, with their feelings of how they feel about the situation. And to me, you know, I think that's a good thing because it goes back into being that human and being thoughtful is that and the empathize part is that you're you're just not give barking orders like I was in the military. This is more, hey, how are we, you know, how is everybody doing along the way, keeping a tab on that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you, you mentioned empathize, and that's the, the second little bullet here, this idea a thoughtful leader also, also empathizes with their team. Uh, taking that time to lean in experience with them, not just kind of saying, y'all go do that, or you do this. It's, we do this together as a team. Um, I, I'll use that word epidata there, swirling about. Uh, it's not a very common word, but it's basically more than metadata. Uh, we do, as project managers, we deal with metadata all the time, you know, data about data. But the epidata is data here, data there, data everywhere, above, around, below, the side, the data around you swirling about that somehow kind of connects in some sort of weird way. Uh, and that's what we have to be aware of, uh, what's going on within the organization. Um, but that kind of requires you to be a little more uh, aware, right? This idea of absorbing comes into play, this idea of absorbing and synthesizing uh, all that's happening uh, are hallmarks of, of a thoughtful leader. Um, the proficiency, the fortitude to, to comprehend all that's going on. And then there's that word discerning, choosing, participating, and not retreating, okay? Uh, discerning is a very interesting word. Uh, when you talk about transformation, and we will a little bit during this presentation, uh, you, you tend to think, well, we're not gonna go this way anymore. We're gonna go this way, a full 90 degree turn. Or maybe you're not gonna go this way, you can go this way, a, a kind of a full 45 degree turn. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually do a two or three degree turn, so a vector change, if you will, you'll still get far, far away though, the farther you go out, but it's more of a, um, a nuanced change, a thoughtful change, a vector change, this idea of a discerning change. So uh, that's pretty big as well. But uh, John, one more click of the slide and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. All four of those words, listening, empathizing, absorbing, discerning, spell out L-E-A-D. All right. So there's, there's the first uh, mnemonic, the first acronym for you. And one thing I'll pitch, yeah, yeah. One thing I'll pitch in there, Ken, is that um, the the discerning part, right? So in the book, we have a data model that we've um, put together for the thoughtful leader, where you're advancing from data, then it, a few steps later, you're coming to knowledge, which goes to wisdom, which is the the wisdom goes into the ability to discern. And so that's the important thing that when you're in the middle of your situations, making your decisions and you're, you know, maybe, you know, getting 360 degree feedback or doing some reflection on yourself at the end of the day or in a moment saying, hey, how am I doing right here? That discerning, that's where the wisdom comes in. Realize that what you're doing there is you're, you've advanced your own internal way of getting data to knowledge to wisdom. And now you're, it, it, once you have that wisdom, then you can discern. So again, that's, there's there's some maturation, as one of my mentors would call it, or growth that has to occur, and that, and that's it, to me that's a lot of fun. Personally, it could be painful at times, but you know it, it's a lot of fun as as I learn the nuances of discerning. Yeah, you know, John, you're so right too. Um, this the, the book obviously has a lot more than we're, we're sharing with you. Uh, we will try to pepper in as much as we can uh, the slides as well as other things like the. You mentioned the data taxonomy there. I'll, I'll try to blend that into a slide that I'm doing here in a bit, but uh, we wish we could just give it to you all <laughs> right now, but uh, it's hard to do that in, in one hour. But here's a bit more about lead, uh, listens, empathize, absorbs, and discerns. Um, but we also, you probably kind of notice on that uh, Scrabble board graphic, at least uh, we talked about making a dent. Um, and th- this is a fun one. I really like this one. Um, it's particularly as a, as a, a thoughtful leader, as, as a thoughtful project manager. I mean, uh, here's, here's the, the truth of it. Uh, D, disorient. This idea that in order to make a dent in anything that you do, uh, whether it's in life or whether it's in your project or whether it's in um, you know, the organization, you real learning 
particularly as adults, particularly as adults, real learning occurs when you're kind of shaken up to the core. Uh, that, you know, and I don't, I don't want to say trauma induced, but certainly this idea that you're kind of shaken a bit. Oh, I thought this was the way it was. No, 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 no. It's this way. That disorientation that you, you feel, that disorienting dilemma, we call it, um, is that new idea that caused you to think in a new way, makes you tilt your head and say, oh, huh, I wonder, or, I'm, or maybe, you know, it kind of makes you, makes you think differently. And then um, the next part of that is extend. It does that new idea or thought is it an extension of something that's already existed before or is it new and novel and brand new? And it's like, oh, this is great. This is it's amazing. And, and the reason that's important is that if you spend a lot of time on something that's already been invented, you could be spinning your wheels. But if you truly have something amazing and new, it's worth extending that and thinking about that and exploring that and, uh, and considering it and um, doing something new with it. Because then you get the end, which is you get to navigate that new road. And that's always fun because once you kind of have that, that new learning uh, and make and you're starting to make that kind of you know difference in what you've been working on, whether it's a project or yourself. Uh, you have it uh, an ability to make it easier to understand because you've got a new path, uh, an opportunity to see something better, um, a, a way to get to where you need to be to navigate. And then finally, that's when you can do that T word, which is transform. Um, does that idea make you want to stop? and go that 45 degrees or go that 90 degrees, right? That's when you know you've done something and made a dent. So there's dent, John. I think we got a bit more on that. Do we have a bit more on that? I don't know, I, I think we, we, that's the one slide we've got for dent. Yeah. So you've yeah, got, can, got, you got candid neck. Yeah. So I think, think about dent. Dent's a good one to uh, kind of help you kind of get your juices flowing and make sure that what you're doing is in the right direction. All right. Yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna expound upon dent when we later on in the, um, when we get further down into the bigger mm -hmm. picture context. So I'll, I'll come back to this. So remember, remember Dent here and we'll, we'll get back to it. I won't stay away for long. <laughs> so, so the next one here is candid. So one of the biggest things that uh, working with leaders and folks is how do we measure, right? How do we know if we're on the right track? And so when we, when we are putting our heads together, thinking, you know, from a thoughtful leader perspective, how do we know we're being thoughtful? And that's where this candid came into place is can you put, you know, the first part, C-A-N, can you put your head on the pillow? You know, when you go to sleep at night, can you rest knowing you've absolutely led in the direction that was best for all concerned, leading from love from your heart with a reverence for life? The did part is, did you have to apologize? Did you have to apologize for your behaviors, what you said, actions, how you made other people feel? And this to me is one of the more powerful aspects of being that thoughtful leader. And the feedback we're getting, especially in some of the, you know, in various circles, is that this brings that human point back in or the empathize point back in to get us back to working from the heart. And that gets into more, you know, going back to the intuition and energy. There's a whole nother, we can cut on a rabbit hole on that one. But, but this sort of opens that gateway into that whole realm or that whole way of thinking when you get to the higher levels of that transcendent leadership. But this is so so again, from a metrics perspective, this is where candid comes in is this is the this is how we look at the view, the metrics for measuring if you're a thoughtful leader. Thank you, John. It, it's a it's a big difference. And uh, it, it's 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 good that you've got some of these mnemonics and these acronyms to help you kind of frame your thinking and your approach as you go through your day to day work and your in your life. So uh, let's hop into uh, to innovate. So we talked a little bit about Innovate at the very beginning of this. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time to kind of frame, you know, how we kind of came up with this one. The, uh, as, as a CIO over the past several years, um, it's been important to uh, stay ahead of the curve, right? Uh, a lot of, lot of uh, chief information officers, uh, at least historically, have spent their time chasing metrics and chasing numbers and that sort of thing. But post-pandemic especially, they've sort of been invited to say, you know, how can we actually do better as an organization, not just better uh, from a financial perspective, but better as an organization. Uh, as John was saying, being candid is a great example of that. But this idea of cultivating an innovative mindset, uh, embracing continuous learning, for example, skill development uh, for all things. So uh, we, we talk about in the book about uh, uh, being uh, having the ability to to learn as much as you can about as much as you can, right? So that's that's the idea of being part of tomorrow's projects. You need to be aware of, about as much as you can. So we have a mnemonic for this. So John, if you pop into the next one there, we'll talk a little bit about that. Yep, and if I could add on here, um, yeah. interject there for a sec. One of the things from a PM perspective is that, 
you know, I, so, you know, using Ken and I as examples, you know, I'd be chasing, you know, so I'd be chasing Ken as a project manager, as you can hear, Ken, he at the C-level executive or senior leadership level, he's going to be trying to be innovative there. That means I, in my PM role or product product lead role or project manager role, whatever, you know, the initiative leader or team lead, or whatever, I'm chasing that innovation, paralleling our team's innovation and how we think and do. And this will tie into later when we talk about flowing value, the context of flowing value to your customer, when you talk about different metrics and you get into flow metrics, which I'll talk about here a little bit later on. But that just want to put some context into that dynamic. So it's not just it's you are it, what you're seeing is is you're seeing it's organizational like ken was saying it's the folks the leaders at the top it's the leaders in mid-level it's the team leaders and it's the people on the ground doing the work hands-on coming together absolutely absolutely and i think you know innovate obviously we were trying to do something uh, amazing here it's, it's easier when you've got a four-letter uh, mnemonic but when you have you know this idea of uh, you know seven-letter mnemonic it's a little, little more more detailed but um, anyway, let's let's kind of kick it off here. Investigate, and I think when people ask me about, well, how do you how do you innovate, and what does innovation mean to you? Uh, what I tend to do is I'll try to you know use instead of the word innovate, I'll use one other word and say, okay, if I didn't if I couldn't use the word innovate, what would be the synonym to kind of cover what I try to say? And the first one that pops in my head, of course, is investigate. So that's why this kicks off with investigate because you you want to explore and research new ideas or concepts, and that really is what. To me, innovation, really the core of innovation is what it is. But again, there's that navigate word again. You see that kind of come back into play. The possibilities of partnerships, the, the new environments for creativity and experimentation. Um, but that also means that you have to network and you know, work with people. You connect with others. Um, we, we do have this idea. When, when I was at Cisco, we had a, a kind of a play on words. We used to say it's all about connections. So if, you're, if you know Cisco, it's a networking company, ha, 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 connections, that, that was our fun part of it. But it truly is about making connections with others. Uh, this idea in your field with others outside your field, connecting, exchanging knowledge, collaborating on innovative projects. This idea of, oh, uh, originate. This idea, embrace the different perspectives and, and coalesce learning and findings into original work and new possibilities. It all doesn't have to be rehashed. It's okay to, to be novel. It's okay to, to be original. Uh, this idea of vision, uh, develop a clear vision of the desired outcome or the innovative solution. Um, when we talk about DevOps in another part of our world, John and I always talk about you know uh, starting with the end in mind. And that really is probably one of the best pieces of advice we can give any developer or project manager or any team member is so where are you actually going? Because if you don't have a destination, I think you know that one would say here, then any destination will do. So make sure you've got that, that vision. Uh, but also have that ability to be adaptable. You know, this idea of uh, adaptability or adapt or the A in innovate. Be flexible. Be willing to adjust approaches as needed. And I'm not saying give up on the idea of uh, you know, you know, meeting deadlines and milestones and that sort of stuff. But I'm just saying be aware of the human side of things. Things happen in life. And just be a, a, a flexible and adaptable. But also never forget to test. You've got to also test because ensure your innovations are repeatable, reproducible, translatable, most importantly. Do they mean something to somebody? Because uh, as you explore, as you experience, as you learn from both your failures and your successes, make sure that you, uh, you take that time to explore and experience. And then finally, there's that other E word again, extend. We use that as well. And this is important too, because it kind of comes up and you saw this briefly at the beginning of our presentation. Uh, make sure that you implement uh, and integrate, not merely install. Uh, there is a difference. Uh, put your innovative ideas into action. So while I'm on here, I'll linger on those three eyes. Uh, most failures in organizations, particularly in projects, is that they kind of stop at install. Think about that. They install a software package. They, they install you know, a new process or that sort of thing, but they don't implement. Or let's put it this way. Maybe they do implement. OK, maybe they, they, they spend two or three years on a project and then they, they install it, everything, all the pieces and parts, and then they implement it and they check all the boxes off and they're done. But are they? No, they're not. Because until you integrate that third eye, it really doesn't become part of the, the culture or part of the, uh, the operations of an organization. So remember to do the three eyes, not merely install, not merely implement, but also integrate as well. That gives you I-N-N-O-V-A-T-E, innovate. And what I'll do there is you notice Ken used the word culture. I'm just uh, planting a seed and we'll talk about that more here in a minute. Sounds great. 
All right, so I wanted to pop this one in because people always ask me about uh, how do you define uh, digital transformation? So I kind of, kind of turned it a little bit here and adjusted it for, okay, thoughtful digital transformation. There's that thoughtful leader piece for project management. So let's talk about these four elements because you don't usually get this when you talk about definitions for, for um, uh, digital transformation or any kind of transformation for that matter. But think about this. It's about how we consume technology these days, not how we, we create it. And all you have to do is think about, um, you know, I'll get my prop here, uh, your, your phone, right? Your, 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 whatever your mobile phone is, you know, it used to be with technology, what we, we cared about how, how much hard drive space we had and how fast our processor was and that sort of stuff. But we don't really care so much about that anymore or how it's created, right? We care more about how we use it and how we consume it. Uh, case in point, you know, how, how do I find the best restaurant in Greensboro, North Carolina? Uh, I use Yelp for that. And if I wanted to get from here to the airport, I would use Uber, right? Or some other app. I would, I'm, I'm more interested in how I consume my technology than merely creating it. So as you're kind of working through projects, make sure you do things that are uh, valuable for the organization, not merely, oh, because it's faster or because it has a better chip or what that sort of thing. So make sure it's, a, it's more about consumption and creation. Um, this next one is fun because it's an idea about leveraging our data nowadays and not just administering it. So here's a good example. And you guys encounter these folks every day. Uh, the, the database administrator, the DBA, very popular role in most organizations, but I'm here to challenge that in 2024. In 2024, it's not enough to really be a database administrator. It's not enough to just administer data. Uh, you need to do more than that. So I'm gonna give you an example. I don't have it on the slide here, but I'm gonna get you to write this down if you wouldn't mind. You can still call the person a DBA, uh, but instead of the administrator, let's make it a database amplifier. Wow, well, there you go. And that kind of leads me to that uh, taxonomy that um, John and I were talking about a moment ago, this idea of you know data by itself is sort of like, and, and we talked about this in the book too, there's a great little vignette or story about data manure. And I'll, I'll just kind of leave it there. <laughs> But this idea that, you know, data by itself doesn't do anything. It just kind of sits there. Only when it becomes information, and I'm climbing the scale now, I'm, I'm, this is the taxonomy I was talking about, data moves into information, is it really valuable, right? But then you think, well, gosh, that's great. But, you know, there's more than, than just information. We need to get to that knowledge stage. So data to information to knowledge. And that's where it really becomes valuable because you can actually uh, make decisions on that uh, decision support um, and do something with it. But that leads to yet another level, right? So you've got data, information, knowledge, and that turns into insight. And that's where that DBA that used to just run select statements and reports for you, and just that's all they did. Suddenly they have the ability to scratch at those data and say, oh yeah, this is what I'm seeing. These, this is what the data are telling me. So this guy, idea of insight. And that leads to what John was talking about earlier. This, this, the next level is wisdom. So data, information, knowledge, insight, wisdom. And you've got the ability to really make some some really nice thinking about what the, the data are telling you. And that leads into discerning. And that's the top of the, the, the pyramid there, this idea that you can use that wisdom to discern and, and make make really great decisions. So this idea of it's not enough to leverage our, our, our data any any doubt. Any, nowadays, you have to do more than just administer it. So the next two things, collisions. It's about our unexpected aha moments of discovery. It's like what we used to do back in the old days when we were, we were inside the, the buildings, we would meet each other at the water cooler and we'd have these ideas and we'd talk about things. And we'd have that one plus one equals three kind of moment where you had an idea, I had an idea, and I'll said together it was a better idea. Sort of like a Reese's peanut butter cup, right? You know, oh, chocolate peanut butter. Oh, together is even better. You know, this aha moments of discovery is, is what that's called. Uh, the academic word for that is propinquity. And I, I talk a bit about that in the uh, in, in my, one of my stories. John's got a great, great story in the book about uh, propinquity and propinquitous moments and things like that. And then finally on this, I'll, I'll leave you with this um, this this slide with, by saying, when, when, when I was younger and coming, coming up, and I was literally told, you know, Ken, you know, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. So this idea of taking what you have and only you have it and you've got to hold it close because you're the one that knows it. And I thought that was inherently wrong then. And then as I've gotten older and kind of done my thing, my, my career, I realized it's not knowledge is not what you what you have, what you know, it's what you share. And I think that's the most important thing here. You know, whether you share from your heart, you share from your brain, you share from your activities. Uh, it's what you share. Uh, is how you make uh, these digital transformations 
more thoughtful, more successful. John, thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the transformations, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty much been, we've been working transformations for global leading companies down to smaller companies. And, you know, the, the sharing part, I would say of this is the hardest that I've seen our clients struggle with in the openness. And I have, you know, a story about that where we actually had a senior executive that was hoarding the data and it basically shut down the project, the transformation for three days. And they had to sort it out at the executive level. They shut down the shut down operations for three days on a Wednesday. And we came back on Monday and nothing was ever said. But three months later, this one executive was gone and, you know, it was just, it, but anyways, I just want to emphasize that the, the sharing part, that that is one of the harder cultural things that I believe, you know, that I've seen or experienced from, you know, from the project perspective. It is very hard because everything that we're taught is to kind of keep things close to the vest or this is my project or my thing. But I, I can tell you just from experience that uh, the more you share, the more success you'll have. Yeah. And I think that's a good segue. And Thami, I, I, I saw that you had your hand raised. Um, if we can, let's get through this sequence because there's a flow here and then um, we'll, we'll take you first um, when, we, when we open up for questions here. The, uh, so from this context of digital transformations, oops, let me get up here. There's a proven formula. And what I mean by this is our projects, the PMOs, you know, the, the, the fundamental uh, change that I've seen, especially in the last couple of years here about, you know, PMOs and project managers and, and projects and initiatives is that for, for the companies that are leading industry and being successful, <clears throat> doesn't matter which market you're in, which industry and in, government or commercial, there is a proven formula that's working. And those clients that get through this formula with the least amount of duress and the cleanest, the least amount of dysfunction and disruption are winning. They're winning their market. They have the best talent. They retain their best talent. And so the proven formula here is you start out with a principles, a values and belief system. And DASA, DevOps Agile Skills Association, is considered the world's leading knowledge, or that's their claim, of Agile DevOps transformation standards. And Ken and I are both uh, authors of these standards, and we're certified, and uh, part of our certifications is for their leadership, which is the highest level certification they have. We are the only two in the United States that are certified to not only train this, but to review uh, the certification transformation plans, which are real live transformation plans of organizations today uh, and that we use in the class. It's a real live, real time class that works on their, the, the classroom takes place doing their transformation. And that to me is the, the way that we, that class is run is actually very close to what we should be doing in our projects, which is it's all about real time, real world situational. How can we, you know, create, iterate, on the fly and have this iterative way of working where we're learning fast, making mistakes, experimenting. We've talked about that. That includes psychologically safe, which is very important. Uh, that's one of the most important things to, to be successful in that. But that's the, that's the foundation that you start off with. Then you get into this next piece, which is there's a required sequence, which we'll go dive into in more uh, detail here in a second. But to summarize it, it's culture, mindset, people, data, process, tools. It, you have to follow that sequence. There's no ands, ifs, or changes here, except I'll give you data or process. You may flip and flop those two around. But basically, you have to get that culture and mindset correct from step one in how you're going to think and do. And this is everybody in the organization from the C-level, most senior executive, even the boards of directors influence that down to the, you know, who's ever lowest in the org chart, who, you know, who's doing the hands-on work. Everybody has to be on the same page there. From that culture mindset, you're going to get the right people that are going to be thinking and doing in this iterative, agile-ish, or I don't even like the terms agile or DevOps. I look at it as dynamic. Can we be dynamic or break away from traditional or be original as one of those key words from our acronyms? Then it gets into the data that people will say, okay, I'm thinking this way, I'm going to use this data. 
I need this data to work with. I'm going to use this process to flow and process that data. And I need these tools then. So the tools requirements come from understanding the data and processes you're going to use. And the context of this is all about Mick Kirsten's project to product book there on the right about flowing value to the customer. And that goes back to dent and, you know, lead by making a dent while being candid. Contextualize that and think about your programs and products in terms of how are we flowing value? And one of the things I do is I actually ask the engineers and, you know, I, one story I have is there was a 90,000 employee company and one of the top engineers there, I, I challenged him. I said, okay, his name was Dan. I said, Dan, why, why do you get your paycheck? And he was, well, I do all this great stuff. I go, okay, that's great, Dan. You're brilliant. We totally get your, you're a brilliant mind technologist, but why do you get your paycheck? And he couldn't answer that after 20 minutes. So I said, hey, Dan, let's go on a journey with me. Three months later, we answered that question. And he said, it's because I'm using the technology in its way to flow value to our customers. And here's what the customers needs and how they need to do it. From that three-month evolution of Dan's thinking around how does he take his technology, and this goes back into that whole, you know, our acronyms, providing value in that context, Dan was one of the top 100 recipients of a 90,000 uh, employee company that was over 50% engineers. And the executives were clamoring for Dan to go in front of the customer because he could articulate how we were able to take our solutions and the technology and apply it to their business for value. Now, this goes into um, the book Transform there, you see, by Marty C Cohen and a group of people. Marty's the our nation's leader in product management and product ownership and basically the product operating model. So the other trend here is that PMOs are getting more into being product oriented or service oriented. And so this goes back into, um, if you mix the Mick Kirsten's book, Project to Project with Marty Cohen's Transform book, that's going to be how the nuts and bolts of, of how you can put together and gives you the concepts and, and guardrails for how to be successful in getting your operation and your organizations uh, flowing value to the customer. And then of course you have to have the required leadership, which we have here. So going a step further here into the culture can, mindset. I'll back up to oh, I'll back yep. up to that slide real quick. So, yep, yep. so how we actually blend into this thing, obviously lead and, and the TTT book, the, the Transact, Transform, Transcend book kind of leads into this as well. But I think it's important to kind of hover a little bit on those two words you see there, organizational architecture and enterprise architecture, just because I think it deserves a little bit of definite, definition. So just real quick on that. The enterprise architecture definition is very, very quick. I, I, like I did with Innovate, um, I, I come up with just a, a very simple definition for enterprise architecture, although I can't claim authorship of this one. This is Jeannie Ross from MIT. Uh, she said that uh, um, enterprise architecture is this idea of organizing logic. It's how you organize the assets in your organization and in your enterprise, right? So uh, from a technical perspective, it's all the applications and all the operations and all the processes and things. That's enterprise architecture organized logically. So there you go, there's, there's a quick definition. Organization architecture is kind of fun. This is a Ken Russell definition. It's this idea of combination of three things. It's your history, your organization's history, uh, not just what they're doing now, not just what they plan on doing or they say they're gonna do, it would be aspirational, but what they've done. What, what, what can you actually go back and, and reliably say, this is what we've always done. This is how it's done here, that sort of stuff. But the history kind of combined with the culture of the organization. And then finally, you add on this idea of tolerance for change. And that's a hard one. That's not as easy as you think. It's like something, oh, yeah, we'll be fine. We can turn on a, turn on a dime, you know, but no, no, no. You've got to have that ability to understand the tolerance for change, the history and the culture. And that, that's sort of a quick definition of organization architecture. So, John, back to you. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for that. And, and this is really important because most organizations, when we talk to them, or even projects at the project level, and we say, hey, is your organization aligned to your enterprise? You know, and most most of the time, to be honest, it's no. And this is especially in the government where uh, some of the government programs and projects have been on, where we've had to basically put in 
at the front of the project or program before we started, we had to upgrade the infrastructure. We had to upgrade some of the enterprise in order to bring on. And then we had to reorganize the people aspect of it and the culture, uh, the culture mindset. And then once we got that in place and we had the two aligned, then we went on to then start actually doing and putting metrics on the project and producing those services or the outcome of what we were trying to accomplish. So the next question you may get, and this is where we want to help you with, you know, like we talked about before, where you being innovative at the PM level, this Zone to Win book by Jeffrey Moore, and then Gene Kim's book, Wiring the Winning Organization. These are the books, uh, industry leading books on how to the nuts and bolts of actually accomplishing what Marty Cohen and what Mick Kirsten are saying about flowing value to the customer and becoming a product operating model. And so this, these two books then, and so what they do is they arm you with the ability to have the conversation, to manage up. And that's so critical for the success, especially for today's PMs and that you're being asked to be strategic. And then coming to metrics, that gets into the whole thing about flow metrics and flowing value to the customer. How do you and your team, you have standard metrics out there for DevOps and agile and software development and, you know, just project management in, in general. But now you have this new layer of what we're calling flow metrics. And this is where your innovation really comes in from the product team, because you guys at the, at the project itself is the best source of decision making and the best innovation comes out of that because you're working very closely uh, with developing that solution. And hopefully the customers, you have an active customer working with you to help in aiding all that. And I would say that's the other thing too, that's, we didn't, I didn't really put a, we didn't put a slide on this to, to accentuate it, but I would say the most successful companies out there are bringing the customer as close as possible to the development teams when and all possible. I know there's intellectual property, you know, we know that there's, you know, secret sauce that different organizations and, you know, sometimes there's classified data and if you're on the government side, but the, the, the goal is to get that customer or somebody representing the customer that truly knows that customer as close to your team, uh, putting this, uh, these processes and tools as you're, you know, around that context of flowing value to the customer. And this goes back into the whole dent piece, or excuse me, our, our you know, leading by making a dent while being candid. The key here is that putting, this is how, when you think about yourself and how are you going to present, how are you going to have conversations? What's your body language? What's your conversations? If you follow these acronyms like we have here, as you can see, they sort of walk you through the context for how you can flow value to the customer. And that's really important because that's what we're, the feedback we're getting and what folks are understanding is that, you know, for success today, this is the level of leadership you you know you you need to have or should be having at that project management level to you know help your organization evolve and transform because it is so hard to do. So from this context and from this you know from that formula sequence and the required leadership gets us into the different modalities. So Ken, what so we haven't you know had time and we really haven't gotten into the transactional transforming transcend and. But what does this have to do with me being a PM in the context of what we just said, what we've been talking about here for the last 45 minutes? Well, it's, it's a lot. I mean, obviously, folks, we, we know we, we've tossed a lot at you. This is our, our last slide. So just FYI, this is our last one. But, you know, there's so much more. And I encourage you, if you get a moment, uh, explore the book. I, I think the book is fun and it's, it has all the stuff in that we, we've talked about here today and, and a bit more. Um, but we started this with the idea of, you know, more than just a thoughtful leader, what kind of leader kind of emerges through all these activities. And, and we kind of came up, came up with this particular uh, infographic, as you see here. Um, most folks kind of come into leadership positions as a transactional leader. So, so think about that. So whether you are the, the, the C-level leader or you're a leader of a team or, the, or you're the leader in your family or you're the leader at your, your bowling group or whatever it is, um, it's 
usually some sort of transactional. You know, I'm going to I'm going to buy this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to do that, and, and I'm going to negotiate with you or with some other partner to make something happen. This idea of setting direction, aligning people in processes, motivating, inspired. Certainly, I mean, this idea of being a leader. Most of us kind of come into it with this idea of it's transaction. That never really goes away, by the way. So I'm not saying that what I'm getting ready to tell you is something that you do instead of being a transactional leader. It's more of an and thing. You know, we're going to be transactional and we're going to be transforming. And this idea of being a transformational leader, it kind of amplifies that direction. Sort of like what we were talking about, uh, making a dent and that sort of thing. Um, but you optimize the resources uh, and you consider consumption and creation, as we talked about. Um, you promote those collisions of aha moments of discovery. Uh, and you, you transform the organization by optimizing the value of shared knowledge. So this idea of being a transformational leader. So we kind of made the definition as we kind of went through the presentation over the past few minutes, but uh, that's sort of what the uh, the transformational leader uh, does. Um, but the transcendence is a little bit different, right? The transcendence is kind of above the fray. Uh, they kind of do the discerning. They do that one or two degree kind of vector kind of analysis. And the way they do that is they don't get buried in the weeds. They look above and they go, oh, this is what I'm seeing. They look beyond the horizon, you see. And then they listen and they become aware of the organizational value, uh, tuning the resources as necessary, uh, empathizing and absorbing, certainly, uh, nurtures the organization, um, and then uh, awaken to the opportunities, imagination, and possibilities of what if. So buried within that, John, if you don't mind, I've got one more kind of hidden gem. I've got one more mnemonic for you folks. Okay. All right, so, so if you pop back up one more, John, just go previous slide. So look at the L of lead, okay? L of lead obviously means, you know, listen, right? That's what we talked about. So pop back down, if you wouldn't mind, John. Okay, so in the, uh, the transcendent, you've got part of that there, this idea of nurturing an organization by learning to interpret, shape, and evolve. Let, let's build that out then. So if I said listen, so, and again, I'm sorry I don't have a slide for this for you, but it's in the book. Uh, this idea of uh, listening. Uh, oh, there, I do have it in here. Uh, thank you, John. I forgot that I was in here. Yeah, but we don't have the definition though. So sorry. Okay. So, so here you go. L <laughs> is for learn. L is for learn as much as you can, about as much as you can. Okay. So real quickly, I know I've got about 10 minutes here uh, to, to have Q&A here, but uh, yeah, you learn as much as you can, about as much as you can. I is for interpret. Interpret that. Okay, take what you've learned and use it to, and for what it means it represents for your organization and for the individuals on your team. And that allows you to shape it. Okay, so if you take the, the learning and the interpret, interpreting and you can shape it, everything around you and you can kind of help kind of shape it to what you need for the organization. And then only then can you really transform because a lot of transformations fail because they fail to do the LIS. They don't take that time to learn, learn, interpret, and shape. So then only then you can transform and not just merely change, but really certainly transform uh, and then finally, the last two I just love because it's about evolving because transformation is not the end game, is it? It's how you get to next and how you actually move on, uh, being effective as you continue to grow. And then my favorite one is that end, the ability to nurture. Because as a leader, what you really want to do is nurture next, you know, the next generation, the next uh, evolution of what you're doing. This idea, that take the time to opt an opportunity to, to nurture your team, help them by doing, staying connected and engage in regular conversations. Notice what I said, conversations, not monologues. Conversations are dialogues. A thoughtful leader is always ready to nurture next. So I'm glad we had time for that, John. That was sort of like my little hidden gem or Easter egg for the for the group here. So I think with that, I'll, I'm ready to do Q&A if you'd like to, John. So whatever you'd like. Yep. What I'll do is let me let me throw one more um, context around this, this right here. So uh, the different, the three different modalities are types of leadership. So one thing I've noticed about myself as a project manager and other and in the project manager role or team lead role or initiative leader or even product owner. What, what I'm finding is that the transactional is how people are used to negotiating for getting, you know, putting the uh, estimating work. Uh, what does a different metric mean? What are things like that? So this is sort of, you know, a lot of back and forth negotiating is the trend i find myself in that transactional mode the transforming mode is all about vision and transparency transparency is the power of a transformational leader and that goes back into that story i, I had referenced about the executive hoarding the data is the reason why that executive was called out and the whole uh 
the transformation was stopped is because we were transparent about what was occurring at the senior levels of our client's organization. And once it was revealed and the light shone on it, at that point, we were able to then measure it and then take the, uh, you know, the leaders did their thing. So from a transforming perspective, realize that it's all about that vision. And this is where that context of flowing value to the customer is so important. I'm sure some, I'd be very surprised if no one on this call has found themselves in a political situation in today's <laughs> world, in projects and just the way the world is. And so the the key on this that I really can't emphasize enough is the why I love flowing value to the customer is because as a PM, as a person in that mid-level management, working with senior people, working with some very entrenched transactionalists, from a transforming perspective, I can then show the vision and flow it value to the customer. And if somebody's opposing you and their idea totally inhibits or blocks flowing value to the customer, that's going to empower you and empower your idea. And so that person that's blocking, even though they're senior to you or it doesn't make sense, it exposes them with the transparency. So that to me is the power of the transformational leader and why flowing value to the customer is so important because it's not personal. It's not about you or them. It's about, hey, we, we're all here to make money, to flow value to the customer. And it basically gives you a way to navigate through today's really decisive um you know, we call VUCA, we add an extra C, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and we add the C for conflictive and ambiguous world. Then you have transcendent. And again, the threshold there is, can you discern above the fray? The fray is the common stuff that's going on, the traditional stuff, all the transactions, but you want to get above that. And to get above that, you have to be calm, cool, be, have to have clear vision and be above it all and relax and then use the various information sources, including your informed gut, the intuition, the epidata, and feel through your navigation and what, what is truly the right decision here. So with yeah, that, I, I think, think you, we've, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I'm going to hop into the Q&A too, because I think you really kind of lead into the first question really, is that, you know, okay. this idea that we've given a lot of good, I think, advice and counsel, but to, to uh, is it Tracy? Yeah, Tracy's question about uh, breaking out of that transactional leader mode uh, how can how can you do that? I mean, obviously there's stuff in the book. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. You're, you're right. <laughs> Read the book. But no, there's more than that, right? And I think part of that is, as we talked about earlier, you know, find ways to do something different. And again, I go back to that disorienting dilemma thing that we talk about. You know, this you know something that's different because uh, different it makes people to kind of turn their head and they they kind of get like because because the, the bottom line a transactional leader stays a transactional leader because it, it's easy. It's, it's routine. You know, you, you go in and you say, okay, this is what I do. This is what people expect of me. I get a paycheck every other Friday, whatever it is. And it's just what I'm used to. So my counsel on that, and, and John, I, I think you'd agree, you know, break out of that. Try to find, even if it's a small thing, break out of that a little bit, try something new, try something different, try something transformational from that next list there, uh, or even transcendent, you know, you can actually do something fun and different, uh, but just kind of break out of that uh, using a disorienting dilemma because uh, it's when the brain is disoriented, is when change, real change occurs. Yeah, and one thing I'll do on there for that is do the exercise, do a disruptional exercise for the whole team. That's one thing I, you know, I've, I know, Ken, you've talked about doing that and I've definitely used that as a tool in my manager's toolbox is bring them, disorientate the team on purpose, uh, create a dilemma and have the, the conversations psychologically safe and then, you know, have, see what happens, right? See what comes out of that. And then that, and then facilitate that, that, you know, and to me, I guess that's, that's one way I've found that if it's, if it's in a team inside my own team and environment, it's my own project team, I can use that to me has been the quickest way to get people to, and then we have a con and then as an afterthought, I'll say, oh, by the way, folks, did you realize what we just did? We were transactional, now we just became transformational. So this experience of being transformational and having the conversations, what do you guys think? Should we do that a little bit more often? And they say yes. Yeah. Most of the time. And I think you'll, you, you'll be surprised, Tracy, that, that you can do that a little, you can kind of these, what, what we call, again, another acronym, OTBW, oh, by the way, uh, is this idea of, you know, you kind of inject those in these, these meetings, these, these long, crazy meetings that are just so dull and boring. You can kind of inject some sort of disorienting kind of, Thing to kind of uh, shake people up a little bit. And that helps you kind of break away from the transactional. 
one thing I wanted to do is I know, I think it was Thai, if I'm pronouncing it right, she had her hand up when we were doing Innovate. So I want to give her the, her, him the floor, sorry there, um, the, the floor if um, you'd like to speak up or come back to the point you were going to make or a question you may have had at that point. I think, John, we would have to unmic oh, that person, okay. and I'm not sure if I, I'll message them and see if they want to type it in the chat. Um, I'm yeah. not sure that they are even still with us, okay. um, but I will send them a message and follow up. Um, okay. But this has been great, wonderful content. Really, I've got a lot out of it personally, and I've seen great feedback coming through the comments. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I'd like to just give anyone else an opportunity to chat in any kind of comments, thoughts, feedback, questions, anything like that. Is this sparking some ideas for you? And would love to know if you've had any aha moments in this time we've had together. And also feel so, free, if you think of something later, you can always send uh, me feedback. I'm happy to share that with our presenters as well. It's been it's been wonderful visiting with you folks. Uh, one more a little Easter egg for you folks is that all the little graphics that you see here, the the little character, uh, the name is Trey, and Trey is obviously T R E, and it means it's, it's Italian for three, transactional, transforming, transcendent, and the fun part is um, all the artwork was done by a sixteen year old uh, illustrator. This is her first illustrating professional illustrating credit. Uh, we can't believe how lucky we got to have her be part of this uh, project as well. So just wanted to share that as well. Great, right, wonderful. Lots of hearts and claps. Thank you all for being with us. Please feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn, send us any thoughts or follow-up questions. And also, if you have a chance to register for the upcoming webinar, I put the link in the chat as well. We'd love to have you back for I think what will be a continuation of this conversation, right? As the next um, webinar coming up, kind of like part two to this, John and Ken. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yep. yep. Next Tuesday. Great. Please. Great. Please do check out their book too on Amazon. And I will be sending follow-up email with the recording, with the slides and have a wonderful day, everyone. Take care. Thank you, folks. Thank you.